Hello, everyone. Welcome to today, today, today's webinar, excuse me, <laughs> an introduction to the National Equity Atlas. I'm Sarah Truhaft, Deputy Director at PolicyLink. For those of you who are new to our organization, we're a National Research and Action Institute working to build a more inclusive America. Our whole team is thrilled that you joined us to learn more about this new resource that we've produced. The National Equity Atlas was created by a long-term partnership between PolicyLink and the Program for Environmental and Regional Equity at the University of Southern California, or PEER. We built it to be a tool for the growing movement for an equitable, resilient, prosperous economy, a movement that we want to help energize by equipping its leaders, and that means you all, with relevant data and policy ideas. Here's a photo of the people behind the information in the atlas. That's me in the middle. Um, let me tell you a little bit about our agenda today. First, I'm going to say a little bit more about the atlas and why we created it. Then my colleague Justin Scoggins, that's him far at the right there, from the USC Program for Environmental and Regional Equity, is going to tell you a little bit more about the indicators and the database driving the atlas. And then I'll walk you through the site and we'll answer questions. And the other team members, Pamela here and Rosa here, they're also on the line. And Jennifer is home with her new baby. So a little bit more about the Atlas. Several, for the past several years, Policy Link and Peer, along with our partners, have been making the case that equity, just and fair inclusion of all people, regardless of their race, ancestry, gender, or zip code is not only the right thing to do, but also necessary to build strong regions and a prosperous economy. In other words, racial equity is actually also a smart economic strategy. This is especially true as we quickly become a nation in which the majority of people are people of color, yet inequality is skyrocketing and racial inequities remain wide and persistent. Already, more than half of all young children in the United States are of color. And we know that Latinos, Asians, African Americans, Native Americans, and people with mixed racial backgrounds are driving growth and change in every community, from suburbs to rural areas to big cities that have always been diverse. These inevitable demographic changes make strategies to include everyone in the economy and in our democracy ever more urgent. We say equity is the superior growth model. The movement for an equitable economy is about putting in place a new trickle-up economic model that's the opposite of the failed trickle-down model that we've had for years. It's about growing more good jobs, connecting unemployed, underemployed, and low-wage workers to those jobs. It's about equipping people with the tools and capacities they need to be healthy and thrive in the workplace and in their families and communities, beginning at birth. It's about transforming low-wage jobs into living-wage jobs. It's about dismantling barriers to opportunity related to race, gender, and immigration status. It's about building communities of opportunity throughout metro regions. And it's about cultivating a new cadre of leaders at every level who reflect the nation's diversity. That framing message and policy agenda is embedded throughout the atlas. Our goal is to democratize data and make it useful for policy advocacy and development for people like you. We want to put powerful data, charts, and maps about the state of equity and economy into your hands. So the Atlas provides extensive data, some of it never before publicly available, on demographic change, racial and economic inclusion, and the economic benefits of equity. And it goes beyond data and provides a host of other tools to help you use the data to advocate for change and develop policy solutions. But data is the foundation, so we'll start there. Justin, can you share a little bit about the data driving the Atlas? Sure. Thanks, Sarah. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so the Atlas draws from a unique regional indicators database that was designed to help people understand for their own state or region, the demographic change is taking place and the ways in which inequality is threatening growth and prosperity and the economic benefits of equity. While there are many regional indicator data sets that are publicly available, there are several key features that make ours unique. First is that it incorporates measures of economic growth and social equity. 
Second, it includes historical data for several economic indicators, as well as demographic projections through 2040. Uh, third, it provides data for metropolitan regions that are geographically consistent over time. And fourth, it includes data cuts by race ethnicity for most indicators. All of these features are critical to be able to connect the dots and tell the story of how demographic change, along with persistent levels of racial inequity, are a real threat to economic growth and well-being in our regions and states, and why increasing equity is the best way to grow the economy moving forward. Um, Next slide, please. OK, there it is. <laughs> so uh, this database that we have constructed and are still constructing incorporates hundreds of data points from both public and private sources, including the Integrated Public Use Microdata System, or IPUMS, the US Census Bureau, Geolytics, Woods and Pole Economics, the US Bureau of La Economic Analysis, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. In terms of geography, data is available, available for the 150 largest metropolitan areas, all 50 states, the District of Columbia, and the United States as a whole for a total of 202 selectable geographies. So, next slide, please. While we pull data from a variety of sources, many of the equity indicators are based upon individual level data, also known as microdata, from the American Community Survey, or ACS. Use of the ACS microdata allows for the custom tabulation of many indicators that are not always possible to get from the more commonly used ACS summary files, and allows us to break down indicators by race, ethnicity, and other demographic characteristics. For example, our indicator on disconnected youth by race ethnicity, which measures the number and percentage of youth ages 16 to 24 who are neither working or in school, is not available in the ACS summary files. So you have to actually turn to these individual answers to generate these variables. Um, use of the microdata will allow us to add both new cuts of existing data, for example, by age and gender, or for more detailed Asian subgroups, and also many new indicators, such as the immigrant contribution to population growth, and access to healthcare. One limitation of the microdata, however, is geography. The lowest level of geography available in the data is the public use microdata area, or PUMA, with each PUMA containing about 100,000 people. The PUMA level map shown here of uh, the Detroit metro area gives you a sense of the scale of the PUMAs, um, with each distinct color in the map representing a single PUMA. Um, while the geography of so while this Puma geography is definitely too large for neighborhood analysis, it can be used to construct higher levels of geography, such as metropolitan areas or hopefully you know, large cities. Um, so maybe the next slide. Uh, that kind of covers the data set description. Just to give you a sense um, of kind of what's in the pipeline, um, you know, we intend this to be a living resource and already have these you know, new indicators scheduled to be added. Um, we're looking at adding, you know, more information on diversity and some, some you know, median age demographic characteristics, uh, contribution of uh, population growth uh, attributed to immigrants, and some, you know, some better in measures of income inequality, including the 95-20 ratio, um, $15 an hour wage, and some more health measures and commuting, commute time, as well as some new, uh, new cuts and new geographies, which coming down the road. So that uh, covers the data set. I'll turn it back to Sarah for a walkthrough of the site. Thanks so much, Justin. I am going to pull up the site now and go to the home page. Hopefully everyone sees the home page there. Rosa? Yes. OK, great. All right. so. Here is our site, the National Equity Atlas, www.nationalequityatlas.org, and you're looking at the home page. So like I said, we structured the site around our framing, around why equity is an economic imperative. So we start with um, a three-part narrative. So you'll, you see here on the home page, the face of America is changing. And then if you go to the next 
slide here, inequity threatens economic prosperity. And the following slide, equity is the superior growth model. So this is really just a preview of the messaging that's built in throughout the site. If you go back to the first one, you'll see each of these pictures has some supporting data. And it pulls a data point from the atlas. So the face of America is changing. We look at people of color by county and region. So the map shows the share of people of color. We know that by 2043, people of color will be the majority. This map allows you to see what that looks like in 2040 in every county in the country and in the largest 150 metropolitan regions. From the home page, we invite you to either go to the summary or to explore more indicators for each of those sections. So let's start with the summary. So the data summary section is a great place to start digging into the atlas. I think of this as your equity story in six charts. So let's look at it. Gives you, right now you're looking at the national data summary. Let's dig into a region. So we'll go to Dallas. So you can type in the beginning of your region, um, and it will pull up the full metro region. And you just click on this arrow. And you'll see the data populating for Dallas. These regional summaries, there's a summary available for all of the 150 regions in the database. And you can get a list of those regions by clicking here. All 50 states in the District of Columbia. We also include the national data here, so you have something to compare your region to. So you, if you scroll down, you can see the face of America is changing. This is looking at demographic change in the Dallas region. And we see that Dallas is already majority people of color. In 2010, 50% of the population was white. 50% of the population was a combination of other races and ethnicities. And that will continue. That change will continue. And we see who's driving growth in Dallas. So overall, 23% growth in the population. For blacks or African Americans, 33% growth. Latinos, 57%. Asians, 74%. So those are the groups that are driving growth. And you can see the white population grew just 5%. As you scroll down further, it will pull up three of the equity indicators in the atlas. So the first one is looking at income inequality. This one here is looking at wages. We know that there's a huge racial wealth gap driven by a racial wage gap. This is showing that gap. So in Dallas, um, whites earned $24 per hour in um, 2012, and people of color earned $15 per hour. So a $9 per hour wage gap, that adds up to thousands of dollars per year, so a huge consequence for people and their families and the whole economy. And then we can see another indicator looking at the jobs of the future in Dallas. In 2020, 37% of them will require an associate's degree or above, but you can see not all groups have that level of education, and especially if you look at Latinos, both US-born and immigrant, um, and the black US-born population, and we really need to focus on lifting up education in those communities since they're driving growth. And then we have the indicator of the GDP benefits of racial equity. So if you actually closed that racial gap in income that we saw, the economy would have been $532 billion per year versus $418 billion per year. So a huge $114 billion in economic growth by raising up the incomes of people of color in the Dallas regions. So this is the, this is the data summary, and it's a good place to start having a conversation about demographic change and equity in your community. But let's go to the harder working portion of the website, which is the indicators section. I'm going to click on there. And what you'll see here is our framework embedded within the indicators section. So you have the section on demographics, and you can see the indicators that you can look at there. The section on equity, and this is further divided into three subsections, 
economic vitality, ready, readiness, and connectedness because we want to look at can all of the groups in the community participate in the region's economic vitality? Are they all ready to be the workforce of today and tomorrow? Can they connect to the region's assets and resources and to each other and the political process? So let's start by looking at a demographic indicator. We'll go to population growth rate. And let's go to a different region. Let's go to a bit of a smaller region, Madison, Wisconsin. Pull it up. And I'll use this indicator of population growth rates to show you the wraparound supports that we provide for each indicator in the atlas to help you use the data in your work. So we're looking at the percent change in population. Right now, it's for the most recent decade, 2000 to 2010. And so you can see the population growth of 13% overall. White population grew 7%. Just like in Dallas, people of color are driving growth. Here it's blacks, Latinos, Asians, people of other and mixed racial identities. You can also look into the future. So right underneath the indicator, you'll see the different selections that you can make to explore this indicator further. So next to the 2000 to 2010, you see 2010 to 2040. Let's go there. So we're looking at projections, and we see that these trends of African Americans or Blacks, Latinos or Hispanics, Asians, people of other and mixed race, they're still going to drive growth into 2040. You can compare Madison to another region. So we have a comparison option here in this indicator. This is not available for every indicator because some of the indicators have too many um, segments in them to allow for it, but several of the indicators have a comparison function. So let's look at Milwaukee, a neighboring region next to Madison or close to Madison. And so when you go to the comparison option, the region you're comparing to shows up in pink. So what we see here is a lot slower growth um, in the future for Milwaukee compared to Madison. The total population will grow 12% instead of 32%. And you can see the differences by group into the future. And you could go back to look at the past decade. Some other supports we have for the indicators, we have a download option. So you can download it and include it in your PowerPoint presentation, put it in a Word document. We also have share functions, so you can share it via social media or email it. We have a guiding question for each indicator. Here is the population growing. So we look at which groups are growing and which are not, and we have a, a data interpretation here. Next to it, why it matters. This ties this indicator to the goal of equitable growth. So why it matters. It matters because Latinos and other communities of color are growing quickly, but these groups face barriers to participating and prospering. Further down, we have some policy ideas. How can you improve on this indicator? So here, we're looking at demographic indicators. So it's looking at how can you leverage your diversity as an asset. So you can see recommendations around racial inclusion and governance, multiracial alliances and coalitions, focusing on specific vulnerable communities like boys and men of color, including immigrants, ensuring participation in voting, in leadership development, et cetera. And then here you see an example of how a community or multiple communities in this case, because it's looking at the DREAM Act, um, how communities are embracing communities of color and immigrants as assets to their community's growth. And at the bottom, you can see additional resources that you can explore. So let's look at a couple more indicators to show the functionality of the atlas. Let's start with wages. 
our go to wages. And here, let's go to a place where wages have been in the spotlight, and they're doing a lot of great policy work, Seattle. So we're looking at wages in Seattle, and I see a functionality that I forgot to mention, which is the definition of the indicator. So next to each indicator name, you'll see a question mark. And when you scroll over that question mark, the definition of that indicator will pop up. And then it will also link you to our more descriptive and detailed technical document. So you could click there. But so here we're looking at median hourly wages by race, ethnicity in Seattle. And we see similar to Dallas big racial wage gap, um, $26 per hour for whites on average in Seattle, and $20 for people of color. I want to show you some of the other breakdowns that you can get in this indicator. So if you go to the next breakdown, it says current, you'll see more detailed descriptions, not just people of color, but different racial and ethnic groups. Um, so you can see the differences in wages by group. You can actually compare this to another region or state. So let's go to Portland, Oregon, not Maine. So you can see here that uh, wages for every group in Seattle are lower, I'm sorry, are higher than <laughs> in Portland. And let's go to a different cut of the indicator by education. So in a meritocracy, we would want to see wages going up with education. We do see that. This is back in Seattle. So we see wages are going up for every group by education level, but you still see racial differences. So that shows you that something else is still going on when people of color, diverse groups, blacks earn $26 an hour um, with BA, blacks with BAs or higher education levels earn $26 per hour in Seattle, but whites earn $33 per hour. So something's still going on. Um, one note about the Asian category that you all know that I just want to acknowledge is that um, the Asian category masks a lot of diversity within that population. So while you see here high wages for Asians, we know that Hmongs, Cambodians, Laotians, other Asian subgroups often have much lower wages. So it's important to know that when you're looking at this data. So that's the wage variable. Let's go to one more economic variable or indicator in the atlas, income growth. So this is looking at earned income growth for full-time workers. And we see here, still in Seattle, that between 1980 and 2012, um, the workers at the lowest percentile, the 10th percentile, their wages actually dropped, accounting for inflation, 12%, while those at the top gain 27%, 26.5%. You can break it down by years, and you sometimes see some differences. Here's the most recent decade. Um, and then you can look at the percentile differences to look at specifically what was happening for workers' wages at the bottom percentile, bottom 10th percentile, for example. Here you can see decline between 1980 and 2012. You can look at the median worker at the 50th percentile. The average worker in Seattle, wages declined. And at the 90th percentile at the top, wages actually grew. So let's look at another indicator here, looking more at human capital readiness. Is the region preparing all of its population to be the workforce of the future. This is where you'll find education, disconnected youth, and health indicators. So let's go to disconnected youth. 
And this time we'll pull up a state, Minnesota. Okay, so disconnected youth is looking at 16 to 24 year olds that are not working or in school. And the first display that you get shows you the absolute numbers by year. So you can see in 1990 there were 49,000 disconnected youth, by 2012, 61,000 in the state of Minnesota, and this breaks it up by um, race ethnicity at the broad level, youth of color, and white youth. Um, white is always gray throughout the site, and people of color is always orange throughout the site, so that's a visual cue for what you're looking at. You can break it up further to look by race ethnicity and see how the different groups are doing on this indicator. So you can see that it's um, black youth, Latino youth, Native American youth have much higher levels of disconnection versus white youth and all youth combined. And then you can look at how the state of Minnesota ranks on this indicator compared to other states. So Minnesota is actually doing better than most other states on this variable. With 9.4% of its youth disconnected, it ranks at 47th out of the, the 50 states. And you can see Mississippi, 19% of youth are disconnected. Nevada, 18%. Louisiana, about 18% as well. Let's go to the economic benefits segment of the indicators. So here we can go to the GDP Keynes variable. And let's go to the West Coast, Los Angeles Metro. So this is showing you what the actual GDP is in 2012 and what the GDP could have been if there were not racial gaps in income in Los Angeles. So what we see here is a huge difference, $510 billion that the region could have had in GDP if racial gaps in income were closed. And that's every year. We also added a new indicator pretty recently about the income gains with racial equity. So this is showing you in Los Angeles what the incomes were for every group and what they would have been if there had been no racial gaps in income because we adjust for family size. Another part of this, this is how much incomes would need to grow for you, for you to see racial equity in incomes. And then the source of gains break down this shows you how much of that income gap in Los Angeles was due to differences in wages versus differences in employment. So this has real policy relevance. Um, so if you look at people of color overall, 65% of that racial income gap is due to differences in wages. So it signals that you really need to work on lifting up wages for people of color in Los Angeles. And 35% was due to gaps in employment. So if you go to a region like Detroit, here we see a much larger portion of the income gap is due to employment, 60% due to employment. Um, so this is really a useful indicator for policy. Let me just walk you through a couple other parts of our site, and then we'll start answering your questions. Um, when you go to the About the Atlas section, this gives you some background about our project, more detailed information about our data and methods, information about our team, and a list of other resources because we are not the first comprehensive website to share equity indicators and information on regions, um, although we think we are unique. I wanted to show you in the data and methods section, we do have a frequently asked questions area, so you can go there.
for your questions. They might be there, and if not, please email us. We have a section on reports. This is where we showcase our analyses. We've been doing detailed equity profile, profiles in regions and states. Last week, we just released two new equity profiles in the Piedmont Triad of North Carolina, in the Omaha region. You can explore those profiles here. And then in the reports and analyses section, you can see our, our reports. And then the data and action section. This is our place to share stories about how people are using equity data for policy action and community change. So we have stories about how Rhode Island used the equity profile that we developed for them to, it inspired them to create an office of diversity and ensure fair hiring for the government, state government jobs. Um, and a lot of other stories about how Portland and Denver are using regional equity atlases to drive change. This is a regularly updated section of our site. So to go back to what Justin said, the atlas is a living resource. We are going to add those indicators. I'm going to go back to that PowerPoint slide. We are in the process of adding these new indicators. We're figuring out what else we're going to do over the year. We know that you all need more local data, data for your cities, data for your um, neighborhoods. We know that you want data by gender and different age cuts. And so we're really working on that and are excited to hear your interests, your feedback, so that we can continue to evolve this resource to meet your needs and empower the movement for an equitable economy. So I am going to stop there now and pull up the question. So now I hope that you've all been chatting in your questions. I'm going to take the first question now and turn to Justin, actually. The question is, the GDP analysis is really interesting. Can you talk a little bit more about how you calculated those numbers? Justin? Uh, yeah, hi, sure. Um, so the GDP analysis is modeled after an analysis, similar analysis that was done in the book All in Nation um, by Patrick Oakford and Robert Lynch. And essentially what, uh, what it does is estimates how much income would go up for each uh, racial ethnic group if uh, all groups uh, had the same age-adjusted average income and in income distribution as non-Hispanic whites. Um, so if you if you did that and then you estimate uh, how much that would increase aggregate uh, income in each region, state, or the nation, um, like the all in nation analysis, we assume that GDP would go up by the same percentage as the percentage increase in aggregate uh, income. Um, what is different about it uh, compared with the uh, all in nation analysis is that um, rather than just considering the uh, impact um, if wages were if there were equity in wages, we also consider the impact of uh, more equity in employment. So there are gains, given that there are, are big employment gaps by race ethnicity, um, there are unsurprisingly uh, gains that would come from increasing employment levels. And um, another thing that's sort of different is that, you know, in, in, in estimating these kind of separate components, the a portion attributable to wages and employment, increases, we're able to decompose the gain by uh, race ethnicity, as you saw in the, the charts Sarah was showing. Thank you, Justin. There's another question about, um, do we have projections of Asians and Pacific Islanders by subpopulation, ethnicity, and nativity? Um, yeah, I see that question. That's We do <laughs> not have projections, although we are uh, currently working on adding just you know, current data on the size of uh, Asian sub -pop subgroups within the Asian population, um, as well as measures. Because I see another another uh, question or comment, which is really uh, a major critique that a lot have had about you know our initial kind of launch of the site is that you know as as is often done uh, is a common sin when using uh, census data that it groups all Asians in one category. Um, you know, when you do that, you really mask a lot of uh, 
you know, differences, socioeconomic differences within Asian population, um, particularly for Southeast Asians, Pacific Islanders, et cetera. So one of our, you know, uh, immediate goals is to add some uh, cuts, some kind of income and empl unemployment cuts uh, for Asian subgroups. Yeah, I also see a question about um, or a comment that we need to break out the Hispanic and Latino groups. So, Justin, could you just share a little bit about what we will be able to do in the future and what our limitations are? Yeah, so, you know, I think, um, you know, part of the, you know, adding, breaking down kind of every indicator um, by subgroups would might lead to a really uh, complex and difficult to use site. Um, so we're going to focus on you know, given, you know, using the microdata, we can, uh, we're definitely going to break out uh, Latino uh, subgroups kind of by ancestry, um, as well as Asian, and perhaps even look at subgroups within the um, black and other populations. Um, some of this is, we're a little bit limited uh, in terms of the sample size of the ACS, so um, it is likely going to be the case that uh, these kind of more detailed breakdowns will not be available for a lot of regions, but they will be available for the regions where they matter most, where there are a lot of big uh, populations of uh, different Asian Latino subgroups. Thank you. One more technical or mundane question, um, but that matters for viewing the Equity Atlas is what's the best browser for viewing? And the answer to that is Chrome. The site is really best viewed in Chrome, although you can view it through other sites, but most of our users are using Chrome, and it really does work best in Chrome. So I would try to do that, um, try to use that, that browser. Justin, another question about the, the data is um, if there is data for pay equity by gender and age. Um. Yeah, again, this is, there's not, uh, I mean, not on the website currently. Uh, one of our, in, in adding the new indicator on uh, the share of uh, full-time workers earning more than $15 an hour, which has kind of been lifted up as a appropriate uh, living wage for perhaps the nation, or if not something close to that, um, we're going to break that one down by, uh, with, by gender as well. Uh, and we're going to try to add kind of gender cut to other uh, economic indicators. Um, and as for age cuts, we're looking into adding that too. Currently, there's there's a broad kind of age control on the all the wage information that is kind of uh, restricted to um, people between 25 and 64, which is sort of considered working age. Uh, so there's some kind of age control in that sense, but we're looking at adding, um, you know, we can't get too detailed because of the, the survey, the data we're working with, but we can add maybe like 25 to 34 year olds at least for a lot of regions. So we're looking to do that. And I think for some of these questions like this, it's, uh, I, as Sarah pointed out, there's a, a little question mark above each indicator, there's a little information uh, box. Uh, we call it a tool tip. And there's a lot of kind of more detailed information for each indicator about the universe, et cetera. Another question, Justin, about the wage differences. So it, the wage difference indicator is that based off of people who, people of color holding the same positions as white people, or are these positions considered and the pay differences dependent on education and career opportunities? Um, so I think I uh, just want to clarify which indicator we're talking about. There's one on wages that we looked over. So the wage indicator, kind of, for a lot of these, you can find out if you look at the information uh, tooltip. Um, but for the wages indicator, um, you know, it, it includes people of in all occupations, right? Um, there's there's a breakdown in wages uh, by educational attainment, which gives you a little more insight into kind of how much of this uh, overall difference you're seeing in the the first breakdown is driven by differences in education. If you see, there's still kind of persistent differences in education uh, wages by hold, holding education constant, then um, it seems there's more of an equity problem. Um, the income gains with racial equity indicator, which is uh, sort of is used to inform the GDP gains indicator, um, that is not where there's no controls for occupation, um, but it is uh, adjusted for differences in age. 
Thanks, Justin. A lot of questions about the data that your presentation inspired. I think it's a good thing people are really digging in. So one question about the microdata that you talked about. It says, um, do you show the, the, the projections are not precise. They have a margin of error. Do you show that for the projected data? The project, so the uh, our estimates from the summary data, we do not show the margin of error. Um, we, you know, the, computing the margin of error is just computationally intense given the size of the files in the, in the regions. Um, what we do, as, as others have done in putting together indicators, sites like this, is to set a, a threshold for the raw number of uh, individual, like, survey respondents um, that are, you know, that the, the universe for each indicator is based on. So we set that threshold at 100. Uh, unique individual survey respondents, um, you know, we, we only report indicators for which is at least 100 uh, respondents. Thanks, Justin. So there's a question here about disconnected youth that I think I can answer. It says, are there examples of specific programs servicing disconnected youth that have used the National Equity Atlas data to make local policy changes at the city or regional level? I'm most interested in youth-led programs. So. The Equity Atlas was launched October 22nd, so it is very new. So I don't know of any community that has used it yet in policy changes because I think people are still learning how to use it, learning about it. Um, but I do know that a lot of people are using information and data about disconnected youth to drive policy changes. If you look on the disconnected youth, page, you can see um, a link to a report by the Measure of America and the Opportunity Index, and they've been using similar data that doesn't necessarily break it down by race ethnicity to drive their policy change efforts. PolicyLink itself, we are working on this issue through the California Boys and Men of Color Alliance, and we've been using disconnected youth data to convene the Select Committee for Boys and Men of Color in California. And I can actually follow up with the, the person who asked this question and connect you to that effort, because I think that they'll have some examples of how they're using data to drive their policy change efforts. They've had some success in the state legislature over the past few years. One question, another question for Justin. Um, is about, is there data or forthcoming data about criminal justice, juvenile detention, incarceration rates? Can you talk about what we're, what we're planning there? Um, yeah, so we are, we're planning to add indicators. We have got uh, restricted ac access to some um, criminal justice data um, and that essentially has kind of, it's like a census of the uh, prison population. Um, so we're looking to combine that with the other census data to get sort of a sense of uh, incarceration rates um, by race for the same uh, geographic areas that you see on the site currently. Thank you. Um, Somebody asked, what are the primary sources of financial support for the National Equity Atlas? Is it sustainable? <laughs> That's a great question. We, as I said, PolicyLink and PEER, are, we are a formal partnership. So we joined together and sought funding together. And we've been extremely grateful to get foundation funding for our efforts over the past four years. This work is funded by the Ford Foundation, by the Kellogg Foundation, by the Marguerite Casey Foundation, and by the Serdna Foundation. And we are so grateful for their support and continued support. And every year, we need to go out and fundraise for the Atlas. So it is definitely, um, we will continue to rely on foundation funding to, to support the Atlas and its evolution. Sustainability of foundation support, that's a, that's a tough question. Um, but we've been, you know, PolicyLink and PEER are both foundation support, primarily foundation supported. And PolicyLink has been around since 1999. And PEER, I don't know exactly how old, but um, we just hope that there are still foundations that will support this going forward. We don't want to 
um, ask anybody to pay for the data. So we, we are committed to democratizing data and making it available and making it available for free. So we don't want to go to a pay for fee for services model. Um, looking down the questions. Um, what about, Justin, there's a question about smaller geographic areas and our plans for adding smaller geographic areas to the atlas? Yeah, so, you know, we're, we hope to add at least uh, larger cities. Um, again, we're constrained by the, you know, size and shape of the Pumas, even over time, because if they change a lot over time, then you have inconsistent longitudinal data. Um, but we're looking to, uh, you know, for most of the larger cities, I don't know if it's, we haven't figured out if we can add, you know, if that's the largest 50 or 100, um, we're looking to add uh, data for this, all the same indicators you see here, if not, or most of them, if not all of them. Thank you. So I think that we've actually gone through all of the questions that people have, unless if you have. Okay, I see a couple more questions coming. Here is a here they're coming. Um, is there a plan to add disability and LGBTQ cross cuts to the data sets and analysis where and when possible? I would definitely say that we would love to add those cuts to our data set, but Justin, can you speak to whether or not that's possible now or in the future? Um, yeah, so, you know, that we would love to be able to add that. Um, we're, you know, all the indicators here are, um, so, I mean, I don't, I don't think there's nationally, I'm quite certain there's no nationally available data on the LGBTQ population, but, you know, if there were at some point, we would hope to add it, and I think this kind of uh, gets to another point about, you know, in some regions, some local areas, there are, are can be richer data, you know, on, on groups that we can't cover here. And, um, you know, one kind of sacrifice we had to make in, in putting together, the, uh, thinking through what indicators we could put on the site and how to organize them uh, was that, you know, we, we wanted it to be a national uh, equity atlas and that covered, be national in scope and cover, you know, all the major regions in the country. Um, with a lot of consistency across the end so that you can compare places and um, it's, you know, th it kind of makes it easier to use in some ways. Um, so, yeah, hopefully we can get some of that data nationally and then we could do that. So there are a couple other questions. Justin, I'm going to answer this question about are there any plans to add more maps and then if you can ask, if you can answer this question after me, is 2012 the most recent year of data that you have real data on? So on the mapping, yes, we have plans to add more maps. Right now we are working on, we're working to choose the mapping technology that we're going to use to build out our neighborhood level mapping. Um, so right now we're in the planning stage, so I would say that would be not definitely not in the first quarter of 2015, but after the, after the first quarter. And we're working to add those. Justin, could you speak to the 2012 question? Uh, yeah. So I've seen a couple questions about, you know, ACS samples and um, 2012, whether that's the most recent year of the data. Um, and yes, so in, uh, if you kind of if you look at the site and you see an indicator that says 2012, um, for many of those, if they're based on the IPUMS data, um, it's important to note, as it says in the tooltip, that um, those data points are, are based on a five-year average. For So the American Community Survey is an annual survey, and to achieve a sufficient sample size to generate these indicators for regions, we pool um, five years together for the last data point. Um, which achieves about a 5% sample of the U.S. population. So it says 2012. 2012 is the last survey year in that data point, but it is an average of 2008 through 12. Um, we didn't need to do that for the earlier years because they're based on uh, public use microdata samples of the uh, long form of the decennial censuses, which already included about 5% of the U.S. population. Thanks, everyone, for continuing to ask your questions.
um, and give us some feedback and um, suggestions on partnerships. So somebody said, can you collaborate with the Williams Institute, um, who's pioneered working with the census data on LGBTQ people. So thank you for that tip. And we do have a, we do collaborate with the Williams Institute. So we can definitely follow up on that. Another suggestion about policy map being a great tool. We include a link to policy map. We agree it's a great tool for, especially for community development and really exploring mapping. And, and we know those folks that the reinvestment fund. Question about will equity factors on alcohol and substance Use, be used against existing data points. Um, I think I'll take that one. We are we have a really long list of um, of indicators that we're thinking of adding, and we know that additional health indicators are of interest to a lot of folks that are using the atlas. So we're looking into those data sources now. It's not alcohol and substance abuse are not currently on our list, but. Like I like we said, this is a living resource, and we may be able to add it in the future, along with reproductive health and other issues like that. One of the things that you can imagine we're balancing as our team is the scope of the indicators that we'll provide. You know, do we want to provide indicators for every topic? Would that be overwhelming? Or do we want to kind of be more narrow around economic justice and inclusion? So that's something that we're just figuring it out right now. Um, so we really welcome your input and feedback on, on what's useful to you, because that's, that's our goal. Looks like we've pretty much come to the end of our list of questions. So I want to take this moment to thank you all for joining us to request that you fill out the survey that's coming your way as soon as this webinar ends. And please give us some feedback on what you thought of our presentation today. Was this a useful introduction to the webinar? Would you prefer to see something else? Are there things that we should consider? Thank you so much for your interest and for using the Equity Atlas and for participating today. Bye, everybody.